the morning must increase. Go ahead and stand on your feet. Man, I don't know what's on your mind or on your heart today, but I can tell you this, Jesus is higher. He is the answer, he is the hope. He is the truth and the way. So this morning I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes real quick. Maybe just put your hand on your heart. I just want you to remind yourself who Jesus is, the life, the truth. His body was broken, his blood was poured out so that you could stand in the presence of a holy, holy God, so that you could come and meet with the Father today. So Lord God, we just thank you this morning. We remember that we enter in because of the sacrifice, the obedience of Jesus. We exalt you, Jesus, this morning. We praise you because you are worthy. We praise you because it is by your blood that we were purchased, that we were bought back for God, that we are sons and daughters of God. We come to lift you high, to exalt the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the name that is most worthy, the name that is holy, the name that is deserving. We lift your name today, Jesus. We bless you. We come into this house with thanksgiving. We come into this house with praise. We lift you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we love you, Lord, we love you. Come on, don't wait this morning. Go ahead and open your mouth and begin to thank Jesus, begin to thank the Father. We love you, we honor you, Holy Spirit. This whole place is yours. Do what you wanna to do today, God.
just put the name of God in your mouth this morning. Mm, Elohim Adonai Rafa Nis. Elohim Adonai Rafa Nis. Elohim Adonai Rafa Nis. Shaddai, Shaddai. Elohim Adonai Rafa Nis. Elohim Adonai Rafa Nis. Elohim Adonai Rafa Nis. Shaddai, Shaddai. Elohim Adonai Rafa Nis Elohim Adonai Rafa Nis Elohim Adonai Rafa Nis We sing worthy is the Lamb Who was slain and seated on the throne There's no one like the Lord Cause there's no one like the Lord Worthy Worthy is the Lamb Who was slain and seated on the throne There's no one like the Lord Oh, elders, creatures bow Giving praise to Him and Him alone There's no one like the Lord so we crown you king of glory we crown you king of glory we crown you king of glory elohim adonai we crown you king of glory we crown you king of glory we crown you king of glory we say you're worthy 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 oh Was slain and seated on the throne. There's no one like the Lord. All of heaven bows. Elders, creatures, bow, giving praise to Him and Him alone. There's no one like the Lord. Is the Lamb. We say, Worthy is the Lamb. Who was slain and seated on no one like we join with heaven oh elders creatures bow giving praise to him and him alone cause there's no one like the lord so we crown you king of glory 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 There's no one like how worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain and seated on the throne. There's no one like the Lord. Oh, elders, creatures bow, giving praise to Him and Him alone. There's no one like the Lord. Sing it out. We crown you king of glory. We crown you king of glory. We crown you king of glory. We king of our lives, king of heaven. Oh, we crown you king of glory. 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 We know that every other God is an idol that cannot see and cannot hear there is one true living God there is one true living God come on declare it every other God is an idol who cannot see and cannot hear there is
is one true living God. There is one true living God. Come on, church, every other. Every other God is an idol who cannot see, cannot hear. There's only one. His name is Jesus. One true living God. Yes. Every other God is an idol who cannot see, cannot hear. There is one true living God. Oh, there is one true living God. Every other God is an idol who cannot see and cannot hear. There is one true living God. Oh, there is one true living God. We know that every other God is an idol who cannot see and cannot hear. There is just one true living God. There is one true, we crown you king of glory. 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 We crown you king of glory.
spirit this morning, if there's anyone in the room that needs something to change and you need to stand on the word of God, you need to come to these altars now. You need to admit that the authority of Jesus is higher than anything that you are facing. Whatever is boasting, you need to make it submit to his authority this morning. These altars are open if you want to just declare his authority over that thing right now. Jesus. Amen, church. Amen. Let me ask you, church, 
Who is the one who died on the cross for your sins and rose again? Jesus. Church, who sits and has all authority in heaven and earth? Jesus. Church, who is your family going to choose today? I'm sorry, who is your family going to choose today? Man, come on, we either believe it or we don't believe it. Who does our community need? Our community needs Jesus. We have the hope of salvation. And it can be found in no other name than the name of Jesus. And let me tell you, our community needs the hope of Jesus. And we're transitioning into a time of, of giving. But I want to just tell you, I was in a, an office this week with two principals in our Forney ISD school system from Rhodes Intermediate and Jackson Middle School. And we're planning, I know it's far ahead, but we're planning the back to school bash which will meet a lot of needs for the community before they head back to school, and we're gonna partner with them. But you know why we can say yes to partnering? Why we can say yes to releasing funds, to, to pour in our community, to communicate love so that we can share the hope of Christ who lives in us? It's because of your guys' faithful ties and your faithful offerings. I want you to, to point to yourself and say, I'm a kingdom builder because you are pouring in and helping to build the kingdom of God when you give your gift back to the Lord. And you say it was yours, Lord, anyways, but I'm funding your kingdom because there is nothing more important than building the kingdom of God for the name of Jesus. So at this time, there are uh, receptacles around the room. If you want to give in person, you can do that. There are three ways that you can actually give on the screen. If you'd rather do online or through the app or through Zelle, you're welcome to do that. But let me tell you, it is making a difference in the lives of people in this church and in this community as you sow into the kingdom of God. I want you to find somebody right now, and I want you to greet them and tell them, I am glad you are here. God's got some good things in store for us today. Robert and Judy Kennedy, and we're obviously not able to be with you this morning because we're on a missions trip to Rome, Italy. Listen, we are standing in front of the famous Pantheon built by King Agrippa in the times of Jesus. It's so exciting to see all this history, but what we're here for is even more exciting. We're with Inspire Global Sisterhood, and we are actually doing our best to reach the next girl for Jesus. We are so thrilled. Our conference is coming up. Well, it's not actually a conference. It's an evangelistic event, and we're going to see lives change right here in Italy. We're excited about what we're doing, but we're also excited about what's happening in Forney today. Listen, if it's your first time to be with us, thank you 
for joining us in service or online. Take a moment, fill out the card in front of you or shoot the QR code and let us know that you are here this morning. We have a great gift as you exit the building this morning. But right now, get ready because Pastor Brian is about to bring a word from heaven. Good, <laughs> no pressure. Good morning, guys. Man, welcome to Mustang Creek Community Church. We're happy you've chosen to uh, join us today. If you're online, man, welcome, and we're glad you're watching with us. I'm excited for what God has in store for us today. There absolutely is no pressure because God is in the house, and he's going to instruct us today, and I'm excited to do that with you guys, our favorite people. I felt like the Lord was stirring in my heart. I'm gonna have the opportunity to share a, a, a few more uh, sermons with you here coming up, but I felt like the Lord was sharing with me to do a series, and the series is gonna be called Faith FAQ Answers to Biblical Answers to Tough Questions. And so I really feel like the Lord is stirring this within my heart, and, and here is why. Okay, I was speaking to some students and hearing what the questions of the students in the, in the public high schools are and what sort of faith principles they're, they're grappling with. And you know, the students are saying that the, they feel like the church doesn't give adequate answers to the tough questions that they have. They feel like the church tries to shy away and just sidestep the tough questions. Uh, and so I, I feel like there's this major need for us to step up and say, no, we have the truth. We want to speak the truth to a generation who needs to know it and is searching for truth. Amen. Now, listen up. Not only that. Right? We as adults, we need to know how to be ready to have a response. Did, did you know? So there was, uh, as I was sharing with someone that we were going to be doing this sermon series, they, they showed me a picture of uh, a city's uh, Facebook page. You know how you can belong to different city Facebook pages. And there was actually a, uh, a post from the Satanic Temple of DFW. And they were inviting people to come to a lecture to get more information and understand Satanism and how it all worked in different religions. Now, I'm telling you, I thought surely the comments are going to be outraged and people are like, no, take it down and all these sort of things. But shockingly, there, there was some of that, but there was people who were engaging and uh, asking questions. And so today I am telling you, there are people who are searching for the truth and they're going to find their truth Wherever they're searching, if the church doesn't step up with the truth and be able to share with them from the word of God and be able to stand up and say, that's not true. So I'm just telling you, that's where my heart for this sermon series has come from. And, and today what we are going to do is we are going to talk about, is the Bible trustworthy and reliable? Is the Bible trustworthy and reliable? Stand with me as we read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. That is where we are going to start today. Then we're going to pray, and then we're going to get going. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Now let me tell you, that word prepared means to be ready, to be willing, and to be equipped to give an answer and to stand firm. And that's what we're going to ask the Lord to start doing today. Let's pray together, church. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is here and is present. God, I ask for you to just churn in our spirits that you make our soil to receive your word today, good soil to hear. God, we ask that you help us to grow and to know you more. We ask for this service to be all yours. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So we're going to be ready, we want to be willing, 
And we want to be equipped to stand and give a response. And I'm telling you, today is the Bible trustworthy and reliable. We're going to tackle a different question every time. But we have to start at this foundation. If we don't start at this foundation, some of these other questions that culture is asking and generations are asking, we're going to come back to the Bible. And so if you don't know that this book is true and reliable, then you do not have a strong and a firm foundation to stand on. And so that's the question we endeavor to tackle today. Is the Bible true and reliable? And all of the evidence, church, points to the trustworthiness and the reliability of the Bible. We're going to go on a journey this morning, and we're going to start by looking at some evidences of the Bible that is not even using necessarily Scripture itself, because many things testify to the Scripture today. Number one, the continuity of the Bible evidence. There are 66 books in the Word of God. The Bible was written over a span of 1,500 to 1,600 years. There are 40 contributing authors. The authors lived in three different continents and spoke three different languages, Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew. So, in order to see that all of these writers, all over the continent, speaking three different languages, can come together with one central theme, because it all comes back and points to Jesus. And so the continuity from Genesis to the book of Revelation, it it is a miracle that it all comes together. How many people have ever played the game Telephone? If you've not played the game telephone, I'm going to explain it to you real quick. Somebody starts with a truth that they know or a a saying that they want to say, and nobody else knows what it's going to be. And they turn around, and they share with one person, and that person then tells the next person who tells the next person who tells the next person. And I tell you, every time, especially if you're playing with my six-year-old, who likes to input all sorts of fun things into it. Every time when you get here, it is perverted from the truth that it started with. And perverted, I mean different and changed from its original context. And so you can see the miracle over that many span of years, three different continents, three different languages. It would be as if today, if we did that from the time of of Christ, and I said, okay, every hundred years, we're going to write a different chapter of a book. Okay, well, let's start with you uh, over in, in Tanzania. You're going to write the first chapter of the book, and, and you speak Swahili, so that's great. A hundred years later, I say, hey, now you write a chapter of the book. You're in Italy, uh, so you speak Italian, and, and you're going to write a chapter of the book, and so on and so forth. And we go down over a span of years. Do you think that book is going to make any sense at all? The answer is no. So you can see, based on the continuity of the Bible and its contents and central theme, that that is a miracle and the evidence points to only God could do it. Statistical evidence. Statistical evidence. Let me me just make sure we're, we're all understanding this, okay? I'm really hoping to get a sponsorship from Lowe's. So this is like product placement. Someone let them know. I can make a little extra cash. Uh, we're going to do that. Okay, so uh, here I have 10 tennis balls, right? I've got nine green tennis balls and one blue tennis ball. So let me, let me help us out here. So I'm going to put all 10 of these in here. And if I ask someone to come up and to pull out the blue tennis ball, how many What's the probability that they would be able to do that? One out of 10, because there's one blue one, nine other ones. Some of the first service said 12. I said, God, just help us. <laughs> Math isn't my strong suit either, so if that's you, I'm in. It's one out of 10. Okay, so I, I want to show you the probability. Did you know in the Old Testament there are 300 prophecies or predictions about Jesus who is going to come. Now, the amazing about this is the Old Testament was completed 400 years prior to the New Testament even beginning. 
where we start to talk about Jesus and we start to see him come on the scene. And so they had no sort of uh, context for this except for that was prophecy that was inspired by God and that Jesus would fulfill. Let me, uh, spoiler alert, Jesus fulfilled all 300 of those prophecies that were about him. Now, there's many more prophecies, over a thousand, but today we're just specifically talking about the ones that were made about Jesus. Now, the, what are the odds? So there's this guy named Dr. Uh, Peter Stoner who took 600 students and over uh, 12 different classes from a university, and his mission was to find the probability that any human on earth could fulfill eight just eight, remember there was 300, just eight of these prophecies that were about Jesus. Now, you can see these eight prophecies. Number one, Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Christ would ride into, uh, on a donkey. Christ would be preceded by a messenger. That was John the Baptist. Uh, Christ would be, be betrayed by a friend. Christ would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, money to be thrown into God's house. Christ would be silent before his accusers. And number eight, Christ to be crucified as a thief. Now, the results I'm about ready to tell you were actually verified by a third party called the American National Scientific Council. So these aren't even, this isn't even believers trying to say, bend it to their own way. This is somebody who is saying, and they said, what is about to be told to you that it was very conservative. So the probability of one person from the time Jesus, of the time of Jesus to the 20th century, fulfilling these eight prophecy would be one in 10 to the 17th power. You can see the number. I just told you I'm not a math guy. Whatever that number is, that's what it is. Okay, so since I'm not a math guy, let me help you break it down to a way uh, you and I can maybe understand it. And it's this, Texas is a massive state. I didn't realize when we moved here how big it is. It could take 17 hours to drive through the whole state uh, and that's pretty amazing. So a silver dollar, you guys know about how big that is? That's about this big, a silver dollar. Right, if it would be like if we were to mark one of these silver dollars and on it we wrote eight prophecies and we, uh, we spread these silver dollars all over the state of Texas, it would actually be two feet deep full of these silver dollars. So in order for this to probability and mathematically work out, it would be as if someone from, we took somebody from mm, Oklahoma, from Oklahoma, from Oklahoma, if you're from Oklahoma, we love you. Uh, if you came from Oklahoma, it'd be like, we'd get someone from Oklahoma, we'd blindfold them, we'd put them in a helicopter, we would take them to the middle of the state of Texas, in the middle of this two foot deep uh, silver dollars, and we would say, get out and find the one silver dollar. That's the probability of that actually happening. But not only does the Bible attest, other documents attest to these things in history actually happening. That is what we're talking about. And the... It, if you move it to 16 prophecies and you try to see the probability of that, it's, it's astounding. It would be as if uh, uh, 60 trips to the, from the earth to the, to the sun. It would take 400 hours to fly around this big ball of silver dollars. And could you imagine trying to put someone on that and be like, good luck, find it. So Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies. And so the prophecies being fulfilled is evidence that point to the reliability and the truthfulness of the Bible. Now let's talk about scientists. So scientists, the, the Bible uh, only proves, is proven right by science, not the opposite way around. So if we look at just darkness, the Bible says that darkness is created matter. Science had said darkness is only the absence of light. But now scientists are saying, hey, it, this is called dark matter because we can see if you look at a star, you can see with the gravitational pull, the darkness actually bends around the star. And science now says, hey, you know what? Science or, or, uh, it is a create, darkness is a created matter and they call it dark matter. You can go Google this and look it up. The Bible said it. Science said, nah, and now science is saying, oh yeah, it is as the Bible actually says. Now you can look up here. I wanna show you just a few uh, things. You can take a picture of this because we're not gonna hit them all uh, if you want to. But um, they used to say, 
science, the Bible said there were innumerable stars. Science then said there was only 1,100 stars. Science now says, hey, there's innumerable amounts of stars. Light moves, light was fixed in, in place. Now they're saying light moves. Let's go to the next one here. And on this page, It says, ocean floor contains deep valleys and mountains. That's, that's what the Bible said. But they used to, you can Google this. They used to say the ocean floor was flat. And then they did this study in which they, they, they started finding these uh, inconsistencies. They took these, this college, went out, did a, a thing, and they dropped things in the water and found out, oh, my goodness, there's mountains and rivers and valleys. The, uh, another one that I, that I saw was the ocean floor contained springs. And uh, they, they used to say, no, it only came from uh, rivers that would, that would come into the oceans. And now they have found that there are springs that come up from the bottom of the oceans. Like the Bible is only proven true by science when they make discoveries. It's amazing. Now let's talk about our archaeological. In archaeological, 23,000 archaeological discoveries have been made using God's word alone as the premise to start. No archaeological discovery has uh, ever uh, proven the Bible to be false. Rather, it always proves it to be real. Uh, let's look at, so they discovered uh, the people group, the Hittites. They found a, a place in which the, the Hittite population was. And in the Bible, it talks about them being this massive army uh, with great strength. And if you look, they found, buried with them in this archaeological uh, dig, they found weapons from that time period that showed the strength of the Hittite people. Now let's look at the uh, the city of Jericho, right? We all know what happened to the city of Jericho, right? So uh, check this picture out. So this is from the, the archaeological study that they did. Uh, this is from some uh, university in Liverpool, but uh, you can see he's pointing to a brick right there. They have found uh, the, the wall of Jericho, but they found the bricks, and they, they say the bricks were fallen down, but they can find no manner or natural reason in the earth around there why the bricks would have fallen down. Now the next one, still Jericho. If you remember in the word of God, this is the only part of the city wall of Jericho that they found that wasn't, the wall didn't fall down. Do you guys remember Rahab where he says, I'm gonna protect this house for what you did? And they even say th this part of the wall was actually thinner because it was, uh, uh, the, it was in the poor section of the, of the uh, city. And so uh, they said it was, it was thinner walls, um, but it's still standing. And that's the only place that they found still standing. Everywhere else they found was on the ground. This last one of Jericho, if you remember uh, in, in the word of God, when it talks about the city of Jericho, they weren't supposed to take any of the plunder or anything from the city of Jericho. They were supposed to burn it. Well, in this pot right there, they actually discovered and uncovered, this is a clay pot and it has burnt grain still in it, showing that it was all burned just as the word of God says. So these archeological discoveries are showing the evidence. The Dead Sea Scrolls, this is a collection of uh, writings that were found in some caves that, were, that had several uh, different things from the Old Testament that were in it and uh, more than a thousand years older than any of the Hebrew manuscripts we already had in their discovery. So because of their age, Listen to me, they, they, these, these documents, they were 100 or 1,000 years older than any manuscripts we already had. And guess what? They were the same as what we have today, proving that nothing was, was left undone and the accuracy of it. The city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, they found Sodom and Gomorrah uh, it, where, where that region was. And guess what was found in the soil of Sodom and Gomorrah? When it says in Luke, he said it rained down sulfur from heaven and fire and brimstone. They found sulfur deposits all around the area where they said they find Sodom and Gomorrah. And I need to point out, these aren't like Christian scientists who are going out to find archaeological studies to back up the Bible. These are secular people in some cases that discover these things, but what they find proves the Bible to be true. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. 
Uh, there's something called the Tel, the Tel Dan Steel, which is actually uh, a, they, it's an architectural piece um, that they would use as like a monument. So they, they found one of those things, and on it was described, uh, the Canaanites had described the house of uh, David in it, and um, referring to the house of David that is talked about in the Bible. In addition to that, ancient Egyptian pipers and clay, uh, cuneiform tablets confirm dates, places, names, rulers, and events. This is not a biblical document or artifact. This is something else that is proving and showing biblical dates and events and those types of things. Uh, I'm not going to go over these, but these are, well, that house of David inscription is the one I was just talking about, but the other ones here on these couple of slides, uh, I'm not going to go over today, but I just want you to see there is 23,000, like I said, that the Bible is used to, to find uh, these types of things. It's absolutely astounding and uh, proves the Bible to be true and reliable, not the opposite. What about the historical evidence? I want to share this with you. The amount of textual evidence in the New Testament and its accuracy. So uh, did you know that the, the, the New Testament uh, was started written about 70 years after, after the author star, uh, witnessed the events? Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are historical books of the Bible. And so their literary style is historical. They're taking eyewitness accounts of what they saw, and they're writing them down for us to see uh, years later. So the important thing to understand here is that it's, if it's only 70 years after the events happened that they're writing about them, there were people still alive who could say, no, that wasn't how I saw it. That's actually inaccurate, and they would cause a ruckus. Imagine if you did that today. I mean, people do that today. You say, oh, I was there. I saw this, and people are like, no way. That's ridiculous. Like, I was there too. That wasn't how it happened. Well, people had the opportunity to say, hey, these accounts aren't right when they were written down, but they, they couldn't because they were true to their words. So not only that, but um, the life of Jesus recorded in historical accounts outside the Bible. So I, I want to show you uh, this literary works, okay? So these are all literary uh, works that are done. Now the New Testament he here is at the bottom, so I don't want you to get confused or uh, lost real quick, but it, it shows the date it was written, the earliest copies, the approximate times span between the original copies, and the number of copies that have, been, that have been preserved, and then the accuracy of it. And so the important thing to understand is that the New Testament has the least amount of time between the span of its writing and, and it being found. And 56,000 copies and 99.5% of those are accurate together in, in the copies. So the, the main point here is if you are to disbelieve the credibility and reliability of the Bible with these sort of figures, the most and the most accurate in the least span of years, then you would have to discredit all of these other historical writings and say there's, there's no reason even reading them or uh, that they didn't even exist. Does that make sense? It's, it's, in, it's incredible uh, the evidence that points to the Bible. Now, the final piece of evidence that I'd like to talk about this morning is the life-changing effect of the Bible. For the Word of God is living an active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through the division of the soul and of the spirit and of the joints and of the marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Isaiah 55, 11 reads, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing in which I sent it. 2 Timothy 3.15, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you about a couple of people, and you may have read some of their books, but uh, there's a man named Josh McDowell who uh, has some, uh, some books on this, but he was a lawyer who uh, for seven years set out on a mission to disprove and discredit the Bible, to disprove and discredit God. Then he went to all these different continents, went to all these libraries, reviewed all these texts, and you know what happened at the end of it? He became a believer because of the life-changing power of the words of the Word of God. God and the credibility and trustworthiness of the Word of God. 
Another person you might have heard about who uh, wrote uh, The Case for Christ, Lee Strobel, he actually set out on a mission to prove his wife wrong. Guys, you got to be careful. All right, he went out to prove his wife wrong, and guess what she got to say? I told you so. Uh, But, uh, you know, so he set out, but his life was changed by the power and the evidence of the gospel of Christ. Now wait for it. If you are a believer here today, your life attests to the power and the evidence of the trustworthiness of God's holy word because the words that are contained in here has changed your life. The life-changing power of the Word of God is evidence itself of the Word of God and what has taken place in my life and in your life. I can tell you before Christ is the most loneliest time and the darkest time in your life and then you come, you read these life-giving words and your life is changed by the message that is within it. It is true and it is true. Reliable. So I, I, I feel like we've, we've gone over several different ways of, of proving the Bible to be true, and I hope we can take these, and I hope it encourages you to say, man, God's word is true, because here's, here's the problem, right? Uh, sometimes we don't know how to respond to people who say the Bible's true, and you're like, yes, it is. It's too. I don't think it is. Yes, it is too. It's too true. And they're like, give me some proof. Okay, now we have proof. Uh, you know, sometimes even, like, I grew up in a Christian home. Like, I... I, I just always, people just told me the Bible is true. So I grew up just knowing the Bible is true. So when someone says, tell me why, I'm like, because it, it is. I've been told that all my life, right? The words have much deeper reality meaning when you know it's true and trustworthy. And this evidence proves that. Now I want to go over uh, some doctrinal truth about the Bible, There's four of these. Number one is the authority of the Bible. All the words in Scripture, guys, they're God's words. And therefore, to disbelieve or disobey them is to disbelieve or to disobey God himself. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, the Bible is God actually speaking to us. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as human word, but as it is actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in those who believe. We are to be subject to the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God. That it, some versions will say are inspired by God. That means the Holy Spirit God used the Holy Spirit to speak into the author's lives, who, uh, and, and it was him who was speaking as he used those 40 contributors. That's why I like the word contributors, because they, they contributed to what God was telling them. Uh, he just simply used them for his purposes. All scriptures breathed out and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correction, training up in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Guys, we have got to put ourselves under the authority of the word of God. If it's true and it's reliable, then we have to place ourselves and it's the word of God. It's God literally speaking to us. Then we need to believe it and be put under the authority of it. It has a purpose in our lives. So as we build on this, uh, the clarity of the Bible, the Bible is written in such a way that its teachings can be understood by all who are seeking. Now this is important, by all who are seeking God's help and are willing to follow it. Some people, they, they may read it and be like, I can't understand it. Well, they can understand it. They just don't want to understand it. You understand the difference. So that's why I'm clarifying uh, right here. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, we talked about this a few weeks ago. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And so someone who doesn't, uh, isn't born again, they, the... the that they may not understand some of it because they don't want to yet submit themselves under it. So, with that being said, Peter does say, uh, there's a verse in, in, uh, 
that Peter shares with us. It says some of the things that Paul is writing uh, are, are difficult to understand. But the whole point is, is that the actual themes of the Bible, the main points of the Bible, they're clear for all of us to understand if we're willing to put ourselves under them and are willing to follow it. The necessity of the Bible. The Bible is necessary for knowing the gospel, for maintaining spiritual life, and for knowing God's will. But it is not necessary for knowing God exists, for knowing something or knowing something about God's character or moral law. And here's what I mean about that is, you know, uh, the word says that the heavens, the earth, the uh, creation testifies to God, right? So if you never read the word of God, you still can see and know God exists by his creation and how it cries out and points to a divine maker of that creation. But Romans 10, 17 says, and, and this is where it's necessary for the gospel, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what? Oh yeah, so faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God and so people can come to a saving knowledge. They need Jesus to, uh, the Holy Spirit to take the blinders off of their, their eyes to see that they have a need for a savior but the gospel is in this book and it shows us how we might be able to be saved and put back into right relationship with God. It's good for maintaining spiritual life, Matthew 4, verse 4. But then he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the very, uh, but by the word that comes from the mouth of God. Listen, this is when Jesus was tempted, right? He, he 40 days and 40 nights in, in the desert, he fasted, and then Satan comes along and says, hey, Jesus, turn this stone into bread. I'm certainly glad it wasn't me, because I'd be like, Texas Roadhouse Roll, some cinnamon butter, some cheddar biscuits. <laughs> you know it's getting close to lunchtime. But thank goodness it was Jesus because he was able to say, hey, listen, man does not live by bread alone, but he lives by the very word of God. You see, God teaches us how and instructs us how to live. There's nothing he's left out of this book that we need for right living. He's equipped us by speaking his words through this word, the Bible. That's the necessity of the Bible. The sufficiency of the Bible is the first doctrine or the last doctrinal point I want us to look at today. The scripture contains all the words of God that he intended his people to have at each stage of redemptive history and now contains all the words we need for salvation, trusting him perfectly and obeying him perfectly. And I'm gonna go back to 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17 and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching showing us how to live, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You guys know what rebuke means, right? It's like, hey, you're messing up. You're messing up. You need to be, not really a smack, but you know, you're messing up. You're, it, it, it's like calling you out. Man, that's, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, for teaching and instructing, for correcting. Okay, now that we're rebuked, where do we go from there? How do we make a course correction in training us to do what is right? So this all comes, right? We've seen the evidence. We've seen some doctrinal things in the word of God. Now, now we have to apply it. What, what do we do with this evidence? What do we do with these doctrinal truths how do I apply this right now? How then must I approach the Bible? That's the question we're gonna end with today. And we're gonna do it in James chapter one, verse 21 through 25. Man, I, I've had the greatest joy of being able to co teach in women's ministry with my wife as we go through the book of James. It has been so powerful and impacting in, in my own life as we're studying it out and, and, and going through it. And this was something that we just recently talked about in there, but it has been, it has been so profound. I, I want to read it today. How much, how then must I approach the Bible? James 1, 21 through 25, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, 
which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But then one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. So I have four words I want to leave us with today. The first word is implanted. When it talks about being implanted, the word of God must become part of our very nature and character of who we are. When, when the word of God is implanted to, into you, that means that it now helps shape and change your character to be more like Christ and to be more in line with the word of God. It's implanted in you. It becomes part of who we are. God commands us to be separate. He went through all rampant wickedness. So there's sin in our lives, and, and the Bible helps us to see that sin. When it's implanted, we choose to live more to the word of God and put away the sin that is trying to, uh, the, and the filthiness and the wickedness that is trying to be part of our flesh. So the first word was implanted. The second word is action. Action. Exposure to God's word is not the same as putting it into practice. Exposure to God's word is not the same as putting it into practice. This is what I mean by that. You can come on a Sunday morning. You can come on a Wednesday night. You can hear the word of God. You can be exposed to it. You can open it up in your own home. You could read it every day. But just being exposed to it doesn't mean anything. It's not the same as putting it into practice. It's hearing is not doing. You know, there's people in the academic world who know the Bible. They know the words of, of the truth of God's word, but to them, they are reading it like a novel or, or like just a, a, an academic book to study. So it's in their head and they know it in their head, but what they don't have is they've not made the connection from the head to the heart. And sometimes we can show up on a Sunday morning, a Wednesday night, or just read it and be exposed to it, but it's in our head and not in our hearts. And the Word of God calls us to approach it and to be doers of the Word. And when we're doers, we take action with it. Letting the Word of God change you, the consequence of not, it's kind of, it's kind of like this, right? Uh, kind of like this, like I made up the illustration, I'm just reading it from Scripture. Uh, like a mirror, Right? How many of you have ever stood in front of a mirror? Everybody. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's, it's frustrating. But we all, okay, good. First service, like, didn't laugh. And I was like, okay, just me. Great. <laughs> Awkward. So good to know. So it's like being a hearer only is like looking into the mirror and you smile and you have a big old black thing on your tooth. And you're like, ah! And keep going. Right? But when you're a doer, you take action. You look into the mirror. You see the black thing on your tooth. And you take it out. And it cha you change and you took action to change. When we look into the mirror, when we look into this, if, if we're looking at this as a mirror and God shows us something in our lives that's not right, something that needs to be changed, a, a doer takes it from the head to the heart and says, okay, Lord, thanks for showing that to me. I'm gonna make a change to the way I'm living. I'm gonna make a change to the way I'm doing something. Thank you for revealing that to me. A hearer only just walks out the door and says, well, that was good. There's got to be a difference. You see, there's, there's a difference. When we sit in here, every time we open up the Word of God, we, we should, which is the next point, is expectation. Every, every time we open up the Word of God, we should be expecting God to teach us something, to show us something, because his, the Word of God is living, active, and breathing, sharper than a two-edged sword. I read that verse earlier. 
I don't care if we're at church, at home, wherever you're reading the Word of God, approach it with expectation and say, okay, I want the Word to be planted in me. I want to be different. I want to take action. I just don't want to hear. So God, I'm expecting you to show me something. For me, man, I, I am, I, I've been guilty of just coming and being exposed. I, I, I've sat through a service and been like, whoo, Lord, that's amazing. I, where had that been all, all my life? And in the moment, I'm like, hey, God, thank you. And then I can walk right out the door and just go about my life. And then later on, I'm like, man, what did you say, Lord? We got to, if, we, if we're going to be serious about this, we got to like take notes, write down what the Lord is doing with us. Uh, on Wednesday night, we shared, uh, sometimes, man, I will share what, what the Lord spoke to us during, during a service. So there's accountability. If you tell somebody and you start putting it into practice right away, there's some accountability. Hey, how's that going? Man, the word of God, God wants to speak to you. He wants to help change you. But if we're not doing, we're not expecting, we haven't taken action, we're just hearing. The final word tonight is submission. Submitting to the word of God as the proper authority in our lives. I remember sitting with, uh, with one, of my, one of my kids and we were talking about this, this situation and uh, you know it was kind of like, this is what they thought about it, this is what I thought about it. And the thought finally dawned on me, this is, this is silly. Hey, what does the word say about this? Because that's the truth is we've got to put ourselves under the authority of the word of God. It doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what other people say. What matters is what God has revealed to us through his word. And then I'm going to stand on that authority because this book, the Bible, is true and reliable. I, truth is just, is just made up. What is truth? Truth isn't made up. Truth isn't what you want it to be. You don't choose your own truth. You choose the truth. But you can't do that if you're not willing to submit yourself under the authority of the truth. You're not willing to take action. You're not willing to come with expectation. You just want to be a hearer and not a doer. God help us. And I'm telling you, there are some times that, that the, the, the Lord, I, I'm, I always believe, preach to yourself first preach to yourself first. I am telling you, I have been so encouraged by this message and what the Lord is teaching me. And there has been this new fervency that has risen up within me because part of the problem, if you've been a, a believer for a long time, you can almost become numb to the word of God. Like, oh yeah, I heard that before. Oh yeah. He's preaching on that again. But when you say, God, teach me something, you know, the Holy Spirit can, there, there are times right now where uh, I, I, we were reading something the other day and I was like, oh my goodness, I have ne I've written that, written, I've read that verse so many times, but what I, I just heard, that was fresh word from the Lord for my life right now. But that doesn't, that doesn't happen if I'm not expecting that. That's what I'm starting to realize. If I come with the presupposition of, oh, I heard it before. But I'm like, no, God, what do you got? You see how the mindset shifts? I'm just telling you. I, 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 I'm being honest with you. Like, I get how we can almost be lulled to sleep if we've been, uh, remember how much you loved the word when you first got saved and you wanted to read all the scriptures? Go, oh, God, help us to get back to that place where we're like, man, I, I'm done. I'm coming back to the authority. I'm coming back to submission. I want to be a doer, not a hearer. I'm just saying what happens to the church when we truly believe that the Bible is true and reliable? Because if you believe today it's true and reliable, everything within here, it changes what we do, it changes what we say, and it changes how we act. And might I also say, it changes the way we interact with unbelievers. It's not, oh, I don't know. You better think, oh no, that's the truth. I, they've, got, they've got to know the truth. There's this thing within us. They've got to know the truth. We have it. And so that, that's all I'm saying today is I tried to give some evidence of the truth and reliability of the word of God. 
And then I want us to see some doctrinal teaching on the word of God. And then I want us to see, man, how can I walk away today and, and be changed by the word of God? So right now I want all heads bowed and eyes closed because I've got to, we've got to bring this thing to, to a close this morning. But here, here's my question. So uh, maybe there's somebody in here this morning who you're like kind of stiff arm God for a long time. You weren't really sure about the truth of the reliability uh, of the Bible. And you're like, ah, you know, I take it or leave it. But, but right now you've heard evidence. You've seen some theological teaching on it. And now you're like, oh my goodness, the Bible is true. And therefore what it says is true. And therefore what the Bible teaches about Jesus is true. Historically, he really did die on a cross. He did die on the cross for your sins and the wages of sin is death. But Jesus took the penalty of that sin for you. And so maybe today you're like, it's all starting to make sense. I'm living apart and not in right relationship with God. The Bible tells me it's true and reliable. It tells me how I can have right relationship with God, admitting I'm a sinner, believing Jesus died on the cross and rose again for my sin, calling upon him and surrendering and saying, I'm doing it your way, not my way, God. I, I totally surrender to you as the Lord of my life. If that is you this morning, and you say, you know what? The Bible's true and reliable. I, I now see, and I want to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Just why everyone's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Slip up your hand this morning. Amen. I saw one. Anybody else? Don't let this opportunity slip you by because I guarantee you there is truth in this word. For those that, that raise their hand, I just wanna give you an opportunity to, to respond right now and just in the quietness of your own heart. You can, it's not about a special prayer. It's about your heart. Just say, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross and rose again as payment for my sin. I'm confessing to you and calling upon you so that I might be saved. I'm surrendering to you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. If that was you today and you prayed that prayer, you're, you're rightly restored with Christ. And we want to, uh, at the end of service, when we come up for prayer, I want you to, to come up and let somebody know because we, we want to help you grow. Not only know him, but grow him in him. The second thing is all heads are still bowed and eyes are closed. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond in a moment, not in front of everybody, not, uh, not, not that we, we shouldn't be ashamed, but if today the word of God and the evidence that was submitted stirred your heart to be more committed to the word of God, to be changed. You, you're saying, hey, I wanna be a hearer, not a doer. I wanna be more committed to reading it. Hey, I, I need to submit to the authority of it more often in my life. If that was you this morning, just lift up your hand quickly and put it back down. Lift it, okay, all over the place. Yeah, praise God, praise God. Well, listen, uh, everybody look right at me. Everybody look right at me. I promise you I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything. I want you to use this, this time. Right now, we're gonna go into a time where the worship team is gonna play. And in your seat or up front, wherever you wanna go, I wanna use this as a time where we can make a commitment to God, right? We wanna let the word of God, what? Change us. In time, right, right where we're at, or up here at the altar, we can pray and say, God, I want to, and then whatever he spoke to you through his word today, I want to be more committed to your authority. God, forgive me for not, uh, for not falling under your authority. God, forgive me for just being a hearer, not a doer. Help me to be, help me to put these practical things into place today. So, so right now, let's do that. And if you want to come to the altar, I'm just going to say these altars are open. Whether you want prayer for healing whether you accepted Christ as your savior today and you just want someone to pray with you or whether you're going through something, come up. Or maybe you're saying, hey, I wanna come up for prayer and, and someone to agree with me what God is doing in my life right now. We'll be up here at the front to, to pray for you. So let's just take this time right now to spend in God's presence and let him do a work in us and through us.
Bless you and keep you, or go ahead. May his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and lead you. Church family, we love you so much. I pray that as you go out today that you are encouraged. I don't know about you, but I am encouraged by this word. I pray that we would be doers of the word and not just hearers. There is a bake sale going on. I know the kids in the kids ministry have worked super hard. They're doing a fundraiser to go to camp. It, I have bought some great stuff. I've already taste tested them. I can vouch for them. It is good stuff. So if you want to support them, it's right out there. Go ahead, support them. Maybe encourage them, even just with words. But we love you. I pray that you have a good week.